Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Roy Yamanuchi. I am with the San Jose Buddhist Church Board of Directors. Um, and I wanted to officially thank everyone for coming uh, to this evening's town hall meeting. Before we get started, I want to introduce some of our uh, ministers and guests. Um, we have Rinban Fujimoto. Kathy Pyatt, Janice Doy, Dina Hainanzu, Ted Nakano, Kevin Kigawa, Steve Sharkulo, and Ed Lott. Did I miss anybody? And myself, Roy. <laughs> um, these are our board members, so if you have any questions, if you have any questions after the town hall meeting, they'll be around, so please feel free to grab anyone and ask any questions. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Rebun Kikoto to come up for a few words and opening the show. Uh, I realize that this is a town hall meeting for the general public and that there are many of you here who Hopefully there are many of you here who are not Buddhists, but we would still like to uh, start with our opening gusho or meditation uh, because we are a religious organization and this is our identity. So if you can all please join me in meditation in your own ways. Namo Amidamas. Namo Amidamas. Namo Amidamas. Thank you very much and thank you all for making the effort to be here tonight with us. Thank you. Okay, uh, one last introduction, apologies. Um, Vintak Patel, from the Congressional Aid from Congressman Michael Nanda, is here this evening. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, it's been about two years since we had our last town hall meeting. That was the first time we introduced the concept of our master plan for all of our buildings here. Um, so that was back in 2012. Some things have changed, but we've made a lot of progress. So the reason we wanted to have this time on meeting tonight is to show you some of the progress that we've done and where we are currently in this project. Uh, we will hear from um, Richard Saito to give us an update on the very successful program that Japan Town prepared. And then Todd Sudama is going to give us a project update on the building project. At the end of the session, we'll leave some time for some formal questions and answers. Uh, we have microphones for everyone to ask, so we hope that you um, can participate in the Q&A. And then before we all move over to the, um, for those of you who are standing for the annual meeting, uh, we will have some mingling time. You can um, get some more refreshments. If you do have additional questions, like I said, please ask the board member if you want to ask that question one-on-one. -on -one. We hope uh, tonight, by providing you this information <coughs> of what we have accomplished so far and where we are at, that you can really have, walk away with a better understanding of uh, our master plan and what the temple um, intends to do. And more importantly, how we can continue to provide the services that we do in this community. Um, with that, I'd like to ask Mr. Seifert to come up. <coughs> Good evening, welcome. Uh, my name is Rick Saito. Uh, I have the privilege of being a facilitator for the Japan Town Community Congress's Disaster Preparedness Program called Japan Town Prepared. This is going to be very brief, but I'd like some audience participation. How many of you know what to do during an earthquake? So, how a third we have slow to do. That's what the kind of is all about. Uh, for all of you, is your home and workplace prepared for an earthquake? Oh, even less. 
They had you secure your tall furniture and water heater. Okay, well that's good. Fuck you. Yeah, I think that's cool. <coughs> uh, do you have an emergency kit? Do you take a first aid kit? Water, food, and uh, some kind of identity? Oh, good. Well, that's good. Well, if, if you said you had a kit, that's part of it. So, um, Japan Time Prepared is a program that started after the Fukushima earthquake, thanks to three leaders in our community. Kathy Sakamoto, uh, Sophie Hori, Chief Forester from UI Time, and Aggie Iwamoto from the museum, of which one, Amadosa. They said, we should be able to respond to a disaster like Fukushima did. And that's why we started this. I'd like to invite you all to participate with us. Uh, as part of the program, we've had town hall meetings, first aid classes, and shakeout drills. Our next step in progression of disaster coverage for the Canada is the creation of disaster relief shelters. This facility is one of our proposed shelters. Uh, the other one, of course, is the uh, gym at Western Methodist Church and then the field at Akiyama. Uh, so I'm in the process of trying to get representatives together, meet with the Red Cross, and become certified as a Red Cross shelter. So these are some of the exciting things that are happening in your community. Uh, I'll be around for a little bit. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to flag me down. And I have a, a small template. I only brought 20 copies. So if you would like one of these, please raise your hand. Okay. Kelvin, if you could take that sign, and I'll take this sign. Thank you. Thank you to the board. I want to thank the Buddhist Church for being a great partner in Japan Town Prepared and allowing us to present our first day of CPR classes every year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, the Japan Time Prepared program is really something that the Buddhist Church is really excited to be a part of, and to, like, as I said, to be a meeting place in such an event that occurs. Um, I did forget to introduce one last person. Um, Bruce Davis is our fundraising consultant, and he's been working with the board to um, really help us get going on our fundraising plan. And speaking of the project, I'll call up Todd Sudama, the president of the Vet Suen, to give us a project update. Sounds like you guys wanted to clap for Bruce, so go ahead. All right. So I kind of threw a little bit of a wrench into this for the video guys, because I told them, first they thought I was going to be standing here, and then I told them, no, I'm not really a stand guy, I'm a stand still guy, so I like to move around, I like to, uh, you know, kind of get some energy into the room, but I think, <clears throat> Rich is a great example of why we're doing this town hall meeting today, and it's just because it's all about community. Um, you know, we really feel like the church is, uh, you know, one of the anchors of the community, and we feel like we're in the community for the community. And then one of the things that we were talking about also was the town hall meeting that they just had for the courtyard. And we thought, hey, that's a great idea, let's do something like that. And so what we wanted to do, so that's kind of what this is all about. It's we wanted to provide information and get feedback. Because that was one of the biggest things that we noticed, or I noticed, when, uh, when I attended that meeting, is there's a lot of interaction. And I went to the first one about the parking issues way back, and that was a little ruckus <laughs> for, these, for these guys that went. But then, I think they, what they did is they took that information and then they built it into the, into, or they incorporated it into the plans and such. And then if they couldn't, then they came back and said, okay, this is why we're doing it, why we're not doing it. So, you know, that's another reason, that's a big part of what tonight's all about. You know, I mentioned that we're in the community, for the community, um, and that's really, you know, a big part of it. We, we kind of, throughout this campaign, we've really been looking internal. You know, like, hey, how is this going to work out for us? We're looking out to our members. And then Bruce brought this up. It's like, hey, you know, the church isn't just for the members. You know, we have CY's Pancake Breakfast. We do, um, you know, we have uh, other events, CUI Kai, we do Mochitsuki, we do... Uh, multiple other, you know, like uh, Rich mentioned, the Japan Town Preparedness, the CPR training that, uh, that Jim helps out as well with, right? So there's m many, many other activities that happen here, and so then we said, okay, hey, we should reach out to these guys, and we also want to include you guys along for the ride. Um, and basically, you know, kind of, I, 
<laughs> I, I'm not here, I see Michelle here. I, I had dinner or lunch at Gombe, and so I was like, I'm here a lot. And then so I get stopped on the street quite often and said, hey, what's going on with the church? Especially last year, because we were pushing really hard. We said, hey, we're going to get it done, get it done, get it done. People were asking me what's going on. Because to be honest, the biggest thing they were concerned about is what are we going to do when the gyms close, right? And so, uh, you know, that affects everybody again, right? It's, it's, the gym is used for huge fundraisers for uh, internal and external organizations, right? And so, you know, that was the number one key thing on their mind. And then for like the gym guys, right? You guys are here two times a week, right? And so you'd have to go out and rent the facilities, which is going to cost 10, or not 10 times more, but, you know, several times more. Right? And that's going to put a big damper on and an impact on expenses as well. So we've been trying to communicate as much as we can to give everybody as much upfront uh, runway to be able to make the appropriate plans. And so basically right now what I want to hear about is kind of some of those things is, okay, what are you guys worried about? Are you guys worried about just the, the closure of the gym? Are you concerned about, because um, right now the gym, footprint isn't changing, so there isn't going to be that kind of concern. Um, we are going to be taking up some of the parking spaces because I know some of the, uh, or actually that whole south side is utilized by the JBA um, um, businesses for parking, so some of the parking is going to be impacted. Um, uh, you know, other than that though, what is, so that's why I want to kind of open it up to make this a little bit of a two-way conversation is, who, what is, what are you guys concerned about? Jim and I were just talking about Obon, the design layout, that's huge, right? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to include a lot of these attributes into the design, because that's the best time to do it, right? It's not when, oh, shoot, the door got moved. What do we do now, right? The time to talk about those types of things is now. So does anybody have any, does anybody, or, you know, why did you guys come here tonight? Just to get an update? Helen? Just to find out what's going on. Okay, fair enough. So we'll come. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, what are your plans and how will it affect the whole community here? And it's helps, helpful for me to know that there is part of JDA on, on the south side of your lot. I didn't know that. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Anything else? Because we'll go over schedule, we're going to go over the scope, and then we're going to go over what, what everybody's doing as well. All right, anything else? All right, so let me just jump right in. So kind of what are we doing? Why are we doing the Generations Campaign? Basically, we, we've launched this campaign so that we can ensure that the Temple facilities will be here for all the future generations to come. And that's fundamentally, that's it right there. We also want to recognize those who came before us. Um, the Temple was built back in the Depression time, right? Um, and at that time, people were able to, during the time when they're, you know, working hard, getting paid not that much, but they still found time and they still found um, a little extra cash to donate to build the temple. This part, the Amnes was built in 57, right? And so, at that time, they also, it was also a little bit struggling time because everybody came back from the war. Um, they're still building back up their, their uh, eggs nest. Um, and so they're, they're still struggling a little bit, but everybody still found an opportunity to be able to donate to the program. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned while we're going through kind of learning what, the, what is happening at the church is like we talked to Seuss the editor. Seuss was telling that when uh, folks returned from internment, um, actually this gym part wasn't here, but uh, there's an annex on this side over here, and actually it was used as a hostel um, for returning families to come stay here. They stay here, they cook, they clean, they shower, until they got on their feet, right? And so that really, really has, you know, a little bit historic value, but it also kind of, you know, hey, we need to make sure this is here for the next generation. God forbid that ever happen again, it's not gonna happen again. But I mean, you know, it's the fact that, you know, guys like Seuss here are stepping up and donating, uh, making donations to ensure that this temple's here for his grandkids. In fact, his grandkid comes out and plays basketball with us on Sunday nights. I don't know if you guys saw the DK West um, article last month, or at the beginning of the month, right? So they had a big picture of the basketball gym. So we run open gyms on Sunday nights here. And then uh, Seuss's uh, grandkid came out, and that was real good. Um, 
One of the bigger, uh, one of the couple other things that we're doing here is that our current buildings do not meet the uh, current seismic or accessibility codes. Um, I put this picture up here because I mean, this is from the Napa earthquake, and I was home watching it, and then they interviewed the pastor there, and they said he said that hey, if they didn't do their seismic upgrades four years ago, that whole facade would have fell off. So they're very happy. They're very happy of the fact that it just separated from the roof that little that is about three feet. And so that really, can, when I saw that, that hit home for me. I quickly wrote an article for the Dharma to put it in there, and Sally made sure it got in there. But I mean, that's us. This is us right now, right? I, if there is a big earthquake, there's a chance that, hey, um, the glue the lamps could come down. Because if you take a moment here, take a look up here at these large beams that are going across. So those are the glue lamps. That's one of the main things we're going to be reinforcing during the seismic retrofit. Now, what it is, is they sit on that little ledge up there. And so what we're doing is, that's the thing that's holding those glue lamps up. Besides, they're, granted, they're tied into the roof. But if we get any kind of like lateral movement like that, then that's where the building, the top of the roof could come down. So what we're doing is we're actually reading the whole entire roof, tying those glue lamps to the roof a little bit better, or a lot better actually, and then reinforce, reinforcing um, these what they call plasters in between tying these two big tilt-ups together. So that's, uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing from a seismic perspective. Um, for those of you that are involved in Obon, the building has reached its infrastructure, I mean the infrastructure has reached its useful life. If you guys are in Obon, you probably have had the circuit break on or pop on you at least once or twice. I think if you guys work in the Tempura booth, barely gets gas sometimes, right? So that, you know, the, uh, when this church was, or when the annex was built, it didn't know we were going to be having what number, how many thousand, 20 something thousand people come through here, Jim? 21,000. Yeah, 21,000 people coming through here for the Obon, right? Back then, probably luckily if we got a thousand, right? But then the Obon has been growing and growing and growing, and uh, um, as well as the, um, infrastructure, or the, the need for the infrastructure, right? So uh, we're going to redo all the gas lines, all the electrical, all the plumbing. Uh, some of you guys are here when it was raining last week, it started ponding up over there. If you guys are in here during, this, during the last couple days, the roof is leaking over here. You can see on the wall where it's all kind of dripping down right there, and you have a stain. Uh, we fixed the one in the back, thanks to Steve. <laughs> so, um, but yes, yeah, but the, the I mean, the building is 50 plus 60 years old, right? So, I mean, if if you had a house like this, you'd be putting it in a roof. Uh, you'd probably be re renovating the kitchen, of which we were doing. You'd probably be doing a few other things to it, right? Well, that's what we need to do for this building. Um, and really, it's all about safety and security, right? We have, like, like we mentioned, we have multiple, multiple events here. CY's Pancake Breakfast, Mother's Day. Um, that, and that, as when I used to serve on the board, there was a little bit of kind of issues about, hey, we got to work manpower on Mother's Day, da 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 But what I realized after working that so many times is it's truly become an institution. Everybody always knows that they're going to see 50 friends here at CY's Pancake uh, Breakfast, and it's not a funeral, right? And it's a fun event, and it's a happy event for everybody. So everybody always knows that's going to happen. So we want to be able to provide an environment for them. We've got the Uikai Mochitsuki, we've got a bowl, we've got Niki Matsuri, we've got many, many other things in here. And so, again, that's what we're kind of talking about. We feel like we are, you know, a anchor in the community, and we need to provide a safe environment for that. Um, so what is the Generations Campaign? The Generation Campaign is a $10 million campaign over five years with two distinct phases. The first phase is a gym and an annex, and if you want to take a moment, take a look at that thermometer back there. So that represents phase one. That's $3.8 million, and what we did is, we, we put the thermometer up there first, but the folks were saying, hey, what do we get for the $3.8 million? And so what we did is we broke it down to all the kind of the main features that, um, that we have, what we're doing. So we're doing seismic upgrades, ADA, men's and women's bathrooms, and for the guys who've been up there, it's kind of like candlestick, right? It's not quite a trough, but <laughs> it's almost as bad as that, right? Um, and the other thing we're doing, ADA, we're at an elevator, right? So it's gonna be much more easier to get up there. Uh, we're doing a full kitchen remodel, um, new electrical plumbing, I mentioned all that, a brand new lobby, and uh, brand new air conditioning. Right? And so that's a big thing. And so what you'll see 
is we, the board and the infrastructure team, what we did is we went and ranked all these additions and all these features and said, okay, what is the most important to us? Okay, seismic 88. So you'll see on the, on the monitor, those are the lowest ones. So as of right now, we can already pay for the seismic and the ADA um, improvements, and we're getting ready actually to um, change the thermometer on Sunday, but we're gonna be able to include the men's and women's bathroom now, right? And then after that, it's the kitchen and such and such and such, and that's, so we I prioritize those features in that order, and so as we make or fundraise the, that money, we can quote unquote buy those things, okay? And so, yeah, again, that, that's, a, that's a priority list. So let's say we come in at 3.6. Okay, we might not be able to do, the, you know, the lobby rent, full lobby renovation, but we'll do something out there. But that's something we want to be able to communicate to everybody here is that that's what's going to happen in case we don't make it. But we are well on our way. I mean, like I mentioned, we, we just got a large donation, and we're going to be able to raise out another 200, 200 grand. And... Really, since we sent out the letter to a majority of the members here in September, so that's September, October, November, December, we brought in close, a little over $400,000. And so that is a huge, huge uh, milestone, not necessarily milestone, but progress for us, considering that in, I was talking to Ray earlier, he started this 15 years ago, right? And so, and so it was a struggle to get up to there. So, so for us to make, or fundraise as a whole organization, 400 grand in like four months. It's that's it's just awesome. Um, phase two, you'll see some of the drawings, and I'll show some drawings a little bit later here. But phase two is the education building. The education building is across the street. That's going to be uh, it's that's going to be a full teardown and rebuild. And so we we haven't gotten to any of the designs of that, but we're definitely going to include Miss Lynn there. Uh, we're going to talk, you know, we've had conversation with Moss Nishimura, who's doing our Buddhist education. Uh, we've also been contacted, uh, some of our, some donors are very interested in how we're going to um, increase the ability to reach out uh, to folks from a, a Buddhist education perspective. So we're talking to those folks about how we want to potentially turn the library into more of a media center, so that they can do talks, they can do presentations, they can do the uh, uh, video uh, showings there, those types of things. And so... So I kind of look at it as like a little man cave over there for me, but <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, that is way, that's four or five years off from now. We'll uh, be doing some of the fun, right? we'll, after we get over this, we raise our three point, then we'll turn right around and launch into that phase two of it. Of, of which, when this Lynn, you're going to be a big part of because um, it's going to be fun. I, I think that's going to be a fun design thing. We're going to, you know, we're going to whiteboard, we're going to go from scratch, right? And so we're going to be able to put everything in there that you want to and such, so. Uh, looking forward to that. So this is the floor plan for the uh, annex building. What I've done is I've highlighted some of the main things that I've mentioned. And so it's the first floor, it's the women's bathroom. We're going to be making that larger. That was a big, that was a big request uh, from all of the ladies on the on the board. Uh, we're also adding an elevator and um, redoing that whole lobby. Um, some of the things that you'll, I think, if you were to look on that um, on the flyer. You'll see what the what the new um, lobby looks like, but it's a big glass lobby. It has a floating staircase in it, and we're opening up the whole second story, so it looks out as well. So you get some of that light into the second floor as well. So it's um, it's going to have some really nice design aspects. Oops. And then with this middle part here, uh, for those of you guys that have ever worked with one or had to take those things out, these are like you know inch and a half plywood boards that are super heavy, so what we want to do is we're going to put in a sliding partition so that we can open up the gym into the multi-purpose room, and then eventually, um, so we're going to take, we're going to open up that whole um, backside of the multi-purpose room. Right now there's a bunch of refrigerators and storage. We're going to clear all that out and then pull those curtains back so that we can look out at the whole door, look out into the garden and such. So it's going to really aesthetically open up this whole building here. So we'll be able to move one panel, two panels, however we want to do. I think it will be really nice for a talkies. It'll be good for any other kind of events so where we're going to be sharing the space. You can manage that as much as you want. And they're going to be acoustical panels as well. So um, you'll be able to close them and have two different events here at the same time. Uh, and then we're going to do a full total re uh, redo of the kitchen. It's going to take everything out, take everything down to the foundation, put in new drains, uh, new uh, gas, uh, gas water, 
sewage, everything in there. We're actually going to be taking out this bathroom right here and then putting a walk-in cooler and a pantry so we can take some of those things off that wall and then bring them back over into here. Um, and then we're, this from the second floor, again, we're not doing too much up there except for changing the men's bathroom. We're just going to be enlarging the men's bathroom slightly. And then uh, again, oh, we're going to, since we're going to, uh, right now, right behind this wall is where the heaters sit. And then so if we make all our money, and which we will, um, we're going to be doing HVAC. So we'll be able to take these heaters out. We're going to go out um, and increase the storage for the archives room in there. And then also we're going to do the same on this side and then create some more of one storage. Um, again, this is the education building. Now, that, now, I want to be very clear that this is a draft design. So this is a, a kind of based on some 10-minute conversations. I'm just checking my time here. There's some 10-minute conversations about, okay, hey, how do we want to do this? Do we want to enlarge it? And we said, hey, we're just, let's enlarge everything by 10 to 15 percent. And then uh, we added some classrooms. This, this right here. What you see on the left here, that's the second story of the classrooms, Lotus Preschools. Um, we enlarged it, and then what we did is, uh, based on a quick chat with Miss Lynn, we said, okay, hey, what happens if you go up to 31 folks? And then, so then there's a lot of square footage requirements for 31 kids. And so then we designed it based on that. Um, it has some really nice architectural pieces, because it, what it does, it'll connect our whole campus all the way through. You'll see this one central, central walkway here that takes us all the way across the campus into, right, and brings you right into the uh, garden and the bundle. Um, and again, that's to, uh, based on some of the conversations we had with some of the neighbors. They're like, get rid of the curse hockey house, get rid of that, you know, build something nice over there. So you'll see a little bit of, from an architectural and design perspective, it's kind of like, you know, three kind of separate sections here. And then so it still has somewhat of a neighborhood feel. And this last one, oh, this is kind of our current status right now. Um, again, we've raised 1.9 million to date. We're about to raise that up to about 2.1, uh, which includes a 365K um, a donation from the total board. And when, the reason I put that in there is because basically, you know, if we can't, if we're going to go and ask you guys for money, we can't do it before, unless we've donated, right? So there's, across the board, we have donated that uh, 365K over the, over the next five years. And we've got an additional tentative commitment for another million. So again, while we do have the $10 million goal over five years, we are, our, our near-term goal is phase one at $3.8 million. These are some of our donor recognition levels. And it's interesting, interesting enough is that folks, they've been asking us, asking, what are the different donor levels? What, you know, kind of what can we give at what levels and, and uh, from a recognition perspective as, as well? So. Uh, we come up with, a, and this is Rebond's idea, where we came up, we dedicated the levels to lotuses and all the different flowers. We're kind of coming up, we're tossing around ideas of how we're going to recognize the donors. I think right now where we're landing at is we may build like a tree. I don't know if you guys have seen it, some of like the, I think it's a Stanford Hospital and a few other hospitals that have a tree, and then each donor is a leaf. And then so you can add on as many as you need, and it's, um, and yeah, you can add on as many as you need and identify the folks very easily. So basically, what's the call to action, right? It's join the dream, right? We need everybody's help. And it really is a dream, right? Because this is something that hasn't been done here in, in J-Town, is to do a renovation of this size, right? It's for everybody. It's, for, it's not only for the church, but it's also for the community. And that is the biggest thing. And, and I, can't, I, can't, I can't, you know, help us, you know, um, uh, reinforce that it is and that's again why we're having this is because of the fact that you know there are so many activities I take for granted now that are aren't just church based right and so that's why you know, we're really reaching out we want to spread the word we want to get everybody excited about this because it's going to be brand. I mean the kitchen's going to be super nice we're going to be adding this braising uh, skillet that's going to make making uh, for spaghetti dinner so much easier and making on it's going to be a lot easier for the new mochi uh, or not much you but they're on pong and then and uh, so we're doing a bunch of things like that um campaign goal again is 10 million dollars short-term goal you know we did some rough math um this is when we you know if we take a look at it, if we get five to ten k donation from folks out there we're going to be able to very easily hit that 10 million dollars um, when we look at our overall reach you know we look at our memberships we're about a thousand people but we look at folks that are still 
because that includes Girl Scouts. That includes uh, Girl Scout, Boy Scouts, Ventures, Judo, Kendo, Bonsai Club. And some of those guys, you know, are, are part of the organization, but not members, but that's fine, right? And so what it is, is but it, what it does is it just increases our net, increases our reach as well. So, um, and again, we need the support from the j -Town community, the businesses, and past members. And I'll be very honest with you, right? That's, what, that's another reason we want to share this information with you, is that, so that you guys can come along for the ride. Because that's a very synergistic uh, relationship we have, right? Um, I go over to Hukilau on Friday nights while waiting for my kid to get done with Boy Scouts, and I see about 10 other families in there, right? <laughs> Eating, you know, having a drink. Um, and before Minato, before Minato's or Gombe, I mean, they're slammed from about 5.30 to about 5 or 6.45 because everybody's coming in with their families, eating dinner, and then coming to meetings, right? So it's, it's something that you see very often. So that's why it's a very synergistic, synergistic relationship we have. And we're very thankful for that as well. Um, so now it's time for Q&A. So we've got a few folks that are walking around here that have mics. And I want to make sure if you have a question, raise your hand. And, um, and to be honest, this is really the most valuable part. I mean, I could, I could talk forever on this, but it's a big deal. But, I, if, um, you know, what we're really interested in is what are some of the questions that you guys have or concerns. How much homework have you guys done? Because once you start picking out permits, it's going to make it, you can't just take out one permit, like the size of permit. One permit makes, triggers all other permits. Now, did you, have you figured out if there's enough electrical power along Fifth Street? Because that's something that Jimbo's had a problem with. I mean, we had, a lot of problems because we didn't have enough problem, uh, power on the, on our farm. And there is no cable on Jackson. You know, so there's, this is an old neighborhood and we don't have the infrastructure, but I don't want you guys to get like hung up on something that you have to change or you know put in a new transformers like like they did for Jimbo. Yeah, great question. So we've uh, done a fair amount of that um, investigation analysis. So in fact, we just met with uh, PG&E the other day. And so what we did is we took, um, actually I did, we took all the gas loads from Tempura, some Taiyaki, from, um, from Corn Booth, from what they do at Nikki Mod City, uh, and all of our, basically all of our equipment that we use at a peak demand, which is Old Wander Nikki Mod City, and put that all into the analysis. And so what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to have to bring in our meters right over here. We're going to be trenching and bringing in a new meter to increase our load, our, our supply, actually. It's a two-inch line right now. They're, they're not sure if they're going to have to go all the way to a three-inch line because that's quite a bit of gas. But um, definitely it's going to be more than two-inch. And then the other thing that we're doing from that from a perspective is how do we distribute it? Because right now the gas line goes up along the kitchen and that's where it stopped, and then it, went, it would go up to the heaters here, and that's where it stopped. But since then, since we've done all the one and done all the, added all those different types of equipment, now it goes across here, and it pipes down, and it goes across here, and it goes back to the corn booth and such. And those, all those loads were not even calculated into the original gas meter, which is why we typically tempered off, well, back in the day, tempered off, had trouble getting a good flame, because the, by the time it goes through all this whole pipe, then it's really a weak, um, a week delivery here, we supply to that. So we have done all that. We also did the same exact thing for electrical. And so um, if you'll notice that we have two actually supplies in here. We have one in that corner for uh, or services from pg &E. We have one in that corner that goes into that full uh service panel. And we have another one that comes in here for, from the, uh, into the corner that feeds this whole site. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consolidate both of them. And we're gonna bring in an 800 amp uh, transformer. All right, so we're going to bring the line all the way in underground all along this south wall here on the outside, drop the transformer, and this is going to become our electrical room. So right now, 800 amps, that's going to give us about, about a 30% overhead than what we, what we need right now. And back to your original question about permits, all those permits are all going to be one big... So, what, so we, um, we selected CAW, uh, Chris Wozni Architects, um, uh, to be our architect, and then Vance Brown is our contractor. And so 
those pieces, all the different permits are going to have to drop into it are all being handled by those guys. And for example, if you take a look in here, they just did a little bit of destructive testing to see what kind of um, uh, connections we have to certain uh, beams and uh, what's underneath the floor. Like, for example, we, I'm not sure if we have asbestos underneath uh, the uh, tiles here, but we're gonna have to do an investigation on that. And then, you know, because we're in the building's 50, 50 plus years old, and, and that was a typical, uh, typical adhesive that they use, right? So we'll have to address those types of things, um, definitely on seismic. So um, you may notice in a few places, there's white X's on the ground, and we're actually getting ready to do a geotechnical survey to find out what is underneath, so that when we start doing all the improvements that the building is, um, is uh, the foundation is um, improved to the appropriate level. Does that answer your question? Okay, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, me? I'm sorry. Uh, we had to do seismic work. Uh -huh. And it was, it was horrible. We've got 600 square feet and it cost over $125,000 yeah. just to do that. Have you had a seismic uh, engineer come and measure out what's going to be done because even over at the Nishioka building, they've got all the million two is supposed to be precisely Richard for that building. And I'm looking at the Kenyan Mo building and that was supposed to be Richard for the two. And that's being held up. And I would hate for this building before you guys get started and now all of a sudden it's like things are doubling and tripping. No, so actually, if you take a look over there, the very bottom thing is seismic upgrades, and that's coming in almost at a million dollars. So all the seismic upgrades is taking up the first 960 something, 940 something thousand dollars. So we have, yes, we have had a structural engineer come out and do an analysis. He gave us a list of actually 10 things to do. And so he said, you know, these guys, right, they're, they're borderline lawyers. No offense any lawyers in here, <laughs> but what they are, they'll say, okay, well, so I, the question I ask is, okay, if we do all 10, is that going to get us through a 10.0? And he said, well, you probably, you know, he's him and a hon. I'm like, okay, if we do one through five, what's that going to get us through? Well, you know, da 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 So I said, okay, pulled everything off the table. I said, okay, off the record, right? We know what, how, how much, how much of these improvements do we need to do? And he wouldn't commit again, but he gave us, he said, if this were my house, then I would do one through six. And then so we bounced that off the architect. I bounced it off another architect friend of mine, uh, Mary Sasaki, who's a member here. She said, yeah, that's probably, probably about right. Because there's a certain amount of overkill that we can do. Uh, for example, um, we can dig up all four corners of the foundation and redo those whole foundations or the corner, cornerstones of each foundation. That's maybe going to get us a 2% survivability, right? Whereas what we're doing right now is we're replacing the whole entire roof. Um, so right up there, what we're doing is uh, very similar to what you'll do if your foundation wasn't connected to your house. What they'll do is they'll, put, they'll not only put tie rods in, but they put a plywood sheeting um, under, in between the foundation <laughs> and your house and secure it that way so that it can handle that, that lateral. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be putting a tongue and groove uh, quarter, one and quarter inch plywood bolt all the way across um, the whole entire roof, redo the tar, uh, redo the tar and gravel, and then what they're going to do is they're going to put uh, steel beams across above each one of these glue lamps, and then they're going to go through with posts, and then they're going to put a saddle on the underside here to tie the glue lamps to the roof, or to those steel beams, so that those won't go anywhere. And then on top of that, what we're doing is that at all these, um, uh, actually, uh, actually, not every other one on this side, but every one on this side. So where, so if you're not familiar with like a tilt up, they do is this whole one section here is um, in this one whole section they they pour the concrete and then they tilt it up and they tilt the next one up and then they just they tie it together. So what we're going to do is we're going to be actually getting sheet net or steel and we're going to physically tie these two. Uh, panels together and so actually it's going to come out about four or five inches but it's going to go all the way up and down like there there and there and then all the way across here 
And then wherever we do any kind of penetrations, we're going to do some seismic retrofit around that as well. So, yes, we have done the structural. Uh, it's going to cost us almost a million bucks. Um, and we've, we feel very comfortable uh, from the perspective of what we've selected to do. Any other questions? Oh, Ted? Can you, get a, can you wait for the mic so we can make sure we get it on here? I'm just a proxy. Uh, people ask me two questions. One, are we ensuring the construction? And second one, what are the plans for like overflow funerals, Otoki, and that kind of thing during the year that we are doing this? Okay, so first thing, I'm looking at Mary Jo, who's our insurance agent. <laughs> so yes, we are. So yes, we are. So there, there are many different levels of insurance. So one of the one of the main insurances that Mary Jo and I talked about is how do we secure the uh, the fact that our contractor isn't going to take the money and run. Because I don't know if you guys have ever done any work. I've done, actually, I lucked out because I had a gardener guy come, hey, you want me to redo your lawn? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then you, you did my lawn, and it's like, oh, hey, you want me to redo this? I'm like, yeah, right? And so I was paying him a little bit at a time, but what he was doing, he was also taking his money and then going other places and other places. And what happened was that a neighbor of mine, four, four doors down, ended up with a nice lawn but no irrigation, right? Because he ran out of money and he was gone, right? And then people started coming to me and like, hey, who's your buddy? And I'm like, that's not my friend. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the first insurance. And so right now with Vance Brown, Vance Brown is a very, very reputable um, uh, general construction, uh, GC. So they do work up at Stanford, they do work up at UC Santa Cruz, they do work, they do hospitals, they do, they don't really do residential, residential is not their thing. So these guys are a tens of millions of dollar company, and they have the liquidity and the assets to be able to get through a project. They won't, they won't take on a project if they know they can't finish it. So there's that kind of insurance. And then there's all the liability and the workman's comp and those types of things. We are also, we are also uh, including that in our contract as well. To what coverage level? Um, you know, it's a standard, uh, I, actually I can't even remember off the top of my head what that liability is. But basically, once the construction starts, a fence goes up, anything that happens inside of that fence is on um, their liability with the exception of flood. Do you remember that? It was flood and something else. There's just two things that it didn't cover. Um, but what, yeah, exactly. So once the fence goes up, that's on their life, falls onto their liability. And, and oh, and there will be a course of construction. So there is a separate insurance policy that actually goes on to their existing um, package policy. It's called the course of construction. Yeah. We've done many of these throughout Japantown and throughout San Jose and around for many, many years for the firm that I work with. So they'll have the proper insurance. Yeah. It'll be inspected and <laughs> make sure that we have it fully covered. So should anything happen in the meantime, while the construction is going on, that it's covered. Yeah. That the Buddhist church. Yes, exactly. And then your second question about the Tokis and large things like that. So, and that, you know, I'll be honest with you, it's going to be a challenge, right? Um, you know, we may move into the 6th Street. We may um, come up with other creative ideas. I know, um, you know, that, that's something that was very, we we're very um, fortunate is that Mountain View, Mountain View Buddhist Church, you know, for like when we were, when we thought we were going to make it last year, we said, hey, you know, can we do Pinewood Derby over there? Are we going to be able to do family dinner? Can we do other things over there? And they very much, right away, they said yes. They said yes, by all means. Um, you know, if they, have, if they don't have anything on the schedule, then, yeah, we can go over there. Uh, we will try to make as, much, as many of the accommodations that we can here. The construction cycle is about nine months. And so, um, I mean, I, you know, it's hard to tell, but uh, I don't know if the, anybody ever Reverend had any other ideas, but we were talking about you. We could go into Sixth Street for the smaller ones, um, even go into the boardrooms next door. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have a start date? Yeah. Good, good, good question. Start date. Yes. So the start date is a day after a bond. 
<laughs> I just want you to see what Jim says. If you guys know how Jim McClure's are a one chair, he runs the whole show. But uh, no, we'll, but we will start if, if we, so we have a go no go date in July. And so that is basically when we tell our general contractor to go. That leave gives him, uh, gives them enough lead time to order all the equipment um, that, that, is, that they'll need to uh, start the project. But typically right now we're starting, we're, the rough start date is the 1st of August. And it'll take nine months. And so um, that was another reason we were kind of happy to, that we missed <laughs> one of the silver linings of last year's uh, that we didn't start is that because that one wouldn't have started until like mid-September, and then that went to finish until like mid-June, or early June. And so for those of you that know Owen, right, mid-June, we're already starting to load stuff up here on the, on the, uh, on the uh, stages and starting to ramp up for it. So, so right now, at August, it's August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. So put in another month in there for slot, right? And then uh, still, still be done by May. Just get them watertight. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Watertight. And right, and then, so the next time we'll have air conditioning for everybody in here, right? <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So, um, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, you know, one of the things I want to thank is the, the board for all the desserts and all the hors d'oeuvres back there. Um, Dwayne Kubo, Al Hiranaga, Bob, for a tape from the, uh, they're from the San Jose Buddhist Church Archives Committee. What, what uh, uh, Dwayne's going to do is, as soon as he's done editing this, he's going to post it to YouTube, uh, and the site is, or the page is J-Town Community TV. So um, if you know anybody that wasn't able to make it or wanted to point them over to it, let them know what's going on. You can point that to them. Um, uh, we'll, we, have, we captured your email, so what we'll do is we'll send something out to you once that's posted. Um, Keiko Itsumi, uh, Jin Yamaguchi, I think where they at? Oh, right here, yep, yep. Uh, Lee Ueda and Emi Tsutsui for uh, coming early, helping set up, and then prepping all the food for us. And then uh, the Troop 611 for setting up the chairs. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions, there's my email. Um, for, the USA, that for, the, for those of you that are members, I always put it in, in the Dharma letter. For those of you that want to join to be a member, there's uh, information back there. There's also uh, pledge forms and donations and brochures back there. Um, oh, me oh. Okay, and so yeah, so there's pledge forms, things like that back there, for, and any other information. Um, and again, we're going to hang out for a little bit more. Uh, we're actually doing our annual meeting tonight, so um, our general meeting next door. So we're going to hang out for another you know, half hour, 40 minutes, and then if you guys have any questions, again, take some food home. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Here. So the functions are now here, but they're going to be right. We're going to be okay. They put the door right in front of the snow.